Real churches develop leaders. In Matthew chapter 28, we have the Great Commission, verses 18 to 20. And this is the core to the development of leaders. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Leadership development is kind of a hot topic. And I've asked myself why. And I think there's maybe several reasons that The whole idea of how do you develop leaders is very, very in vogue. Um, One reason is, is because there are a lot of churches that are declining and they know that they have a lack of leaders. And um, so they know there's a problem there and they need help. I think another reason why leadership development is such a hot topic is because There's a basic misunderstanding in many places on what the Great Commission really is. In many places, the Great Commission is go and make leaders. But that's not the Great Commission. In fact, if the goal becomes in a church just to make leaders, then it's the wrong way to develop leaders. In fact, what can happen in a church is that if the goal is just having more and more leaders, it often becomes a problem that you take even people who aren't ready to be leaders and you make them leaders. And this is a sign of God's judgment on a church. It's a sign of God's judgment on a society when children, spiritual children or even physical children, are made leaders. And so in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, Isaiah speaks of God's judgment on the nation as to what was really happening. He says, I will make boys their officials. Mere children will govern them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. A man will seize one of his brothers at his father's home and say, You have a cloak. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. And so one of the things that has to happen in a church is there has to be the development of leaders, not thrusting children into leadership, spiritual children, but rather an atmosphere in a church where people can develop and grow through the natural stages and not be thrust into leadership prematurely. Because the Great Commission is not go and make leaders, the Great Commission is to go and make disciples. The word literally means one who learns. Go and make learners of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we read in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. One wise missiologist said, If we just set out to produce a race of leaders, what we shall succeed in doing is probably to produce a race of restless, ambitious, and discontented intellectuals. To tell a man that he's called to be a leader is the best way of ensuring his spiritual ruin. Since in the Christian world, ambition is more deadly than any other sin, and if yielded to, makes a man unprofitable in the ministry. 
The most important thing today is the spiritual rather than the intellectual quality of those indigenous Christians who are called to bear responsibility in the younger churches. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is then the profile of a disciple? And in a church, we have to be asking the question, what is your process for how you make disciples? And that's what we're going to look at in this first session. I want to give you a profile of a learner. And this comes out of a personal study of scripture and my involvement in a group of campus ministry people called the Navigators. Early in my ministry, I spent a summer where in the morning we would work in a camp and then in the afternoon we would study the Bible. I did this for one summer when I was in college. And we looked up every reference in the Bible to the word learner, the word disciple, mathetes in the Greek. It's very interesting that this word never appears past the book of Acts. It's not in the epistles. It's not in the book of Revelation. It's only in the four gospels and the book of Acts. This word, disciple, mathetes, a learner. And as I looked up a definition of a learner, what I came to embrace was something that has been helpful to me, and that is the wheel illustration. And it's found in uh, courses like the Colossians 2.7 series. This is uh, available in languages all over the world. It's also av av available in what's called the Design for Discipleship. And it pictures how the Christian life can be compared to um, a wheel. And that a disciple's life can be compared to a wheel. And so this book explains it, lays it out, and it shows the basic idea that the outer rim of the wheel is that every Christian is to be obedient. The basic definition of, of a disciple is obey. Jesus said, we're to obey everything that he's taught us. So the obedient Christian life is where the rubber meets the road. And this can happen only if Christ is at the center of our life. And we spent our first session on that, and we look closely at that idea. And then this portrays that in our vertical relationship with God, we need to be committed to prayer, and we need to be committed to the reading of God's word. Vertically, that's how we relate to God in the most basic way. And then horizontally, we witness to those who don't know Christ, and we have fellowship with those that do. And so this is a simple profile, in a sense, if you will, of what it means to be a disciple, a learner. And everyone, every Christian is called to do this. We're all called to be witnesses for Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope you have, and do this with gentleness and respect. And so we speak of what we know, John says in John 3, 11, and we are to speak of Christ when we're asked not what is the reason for the hope that's in you, but perhaps why is it that, why is it that you're cheerful every day? Why is, is, why is it and how is it that you have been happily married? How is it that you, um, you know, really enjoy being a student and you're not always complaining about it? So we can be asked in many different ways, and when we're asked, we point people back to Christ. And that's one thing a disciple does. And the second thing we do is we, horizontally, we have fellowship with one another. The word koinonia, the Greek word, literally means a sharing, a partnership, an association, a community of people. And we are to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's interesting in the early church, what they did almost every Sunday was two things. In the early church, they would practice the Lord's Supper. We call it communion, the breaking of the bread, and the taking of the fruit of the vine. And so we remember Christ's death until he comes by participating in the Lord's Supper. 
What's interesting is, though, that the early church also practiced what was called the love feast. And you remember that in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks to the Corinthians about the fact that they have love feasts, that they come together, and he says, hey, why are you guys gorging on food when you come together? Why are you coming together and drinking so much wine that you're almost drunk? Can't you contain yourself? Can't you eat some food at home if you're starving? Because you see, the regular practice of the early church, like two wings on an airplane, one was they regularly practiced the Lord's Supper, and they also regularly practiced the love feast, genuine fellowship and sharing of lives together. And in churches that are healthy, we not only practice the Lord's Supper, but we eat in one another's homes and we party together in a Christian way. And then we are to be feeding on the Word of God. There's a uniqueness to the Scripture. We're to be devoted and be strong in Scripture. We're to be devoted in, to prayer. We're to be devoted to Christ as the center of our life. And so this profile, I think, is very helpful. It's been in my mind since I was a baby Christian that these are all important to be obedient, to have Christ at the center, to be in the Word and prayer each day, to be committed to witnessing and fellowship. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. So, that's a profile of a disciple. We all need to have a picture in our mind of what it means to really be a disciple of Christ. But we also need to have a process in mind of how we can fulfill the Great Commission of making disciples. And that's where I want to encourage you that every believer can do what I'm going to describe right now. And that is simply make disciples by meeting one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, with another person that you're helping to grow in Jesus Christ. Not everybody can lead a small group. Not everybody can preach. Not everybody can lead. But everybody can say to a friend, hey, why don't we get together and um, grow, learn together about what it means to really follow Christ. I want to give you a couple of examples out of my own life. When I was a pastor in America, a guy named Paul came to my office and he was going through a divorce. And I shared the gospel. I pointed him to Jesus. And as he was driving home that day, he received Jesus Christ into his heart and his life changed. And we began to meet on a regular basis for just a period of a few months. And we went through material like this that I described to you earlier. Lots of good material out there now that you can use where it's designed to help a young Christian grow in the basics of the Christian life, whether it's the 2-7 or Design for Discipleship or many, many different materials have now been produced. We use this one. And later people would remark to me, you know, Paul, he's really a changed person. You know, Paul, we don't know what you're doing with him, but we like what we see. The results in his life are amazing. And to this day, Paul and I are still friends. Some of the most precious friendships I have are from the people that I spent individual time with to learn together, to grow together as disciples in Jesus Christ.